This program features live coverage of an African safari and may include animal kills and carcasses. Viewer discretion is advised. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to a chilly uh, northeastern part of South Africa. It's colder than it normally is. You can see there's a bit of a wind blowing, but that hasn't stopped some of our animals being out and about already. As you can see, there's an impala, there's some zebras, and it seems to be the perfect start to our afternoon. Now, before we get into all of these things and discuss all of these animals, my name is Tristan. On camera, I've got Alex this afternoon, and it is a very, very warm welcome to all of you that are watching, but especially the kids that are watching all around the world. This first 45 minutes is dedicated to all of you, so remember that you can ask all the questions that you want to ask, and you can do so using kidsquestions at wildearth.tv, um, and we'll try and answer as many as we can. Now, these zebras, I'm sure, are enjoying the fact that they can be out in the open um, even though it's kind of early afternoon. Normally at this time of the afternoon, a few days ago even, it was hot and they would have been un very uncomfortable. They would have had to find some shade to stand in. But now because of this really cold breeze that's blowing and the fact that it's very cold today, it means that they can stand right out in the open and they can eat on this nice nutritious grass that they find here as well as be able to look out for any predators. Often when it's very windy like this, the predators will try and hunt them down even during the day and so much easier for them to see what's going on in these kind of clearings um, and basically find this area for the night. Um, it's not just the two of them, there are two there and then there's another two to the right of them um, which is nice to see. I haven't seen too many zebras around in the last few weeks. Uh, not that they are hugely common here just given the, the terrain that we have. It's generally a little bit too thick for them but we do normally see some kind of hanging around quarantine, this open clearing or sandy patch or down on Philemon's cut line, but they've been a bit scarce, so I don't know where these guys have come from. In fact, actually, there's more of them. I see some more to the right of those ones even, which is cool. It used to be a herd that used to hang around here all the time, and they got so used to us actually on foot that you'd be able to get really, really close, which was quite nice. All right, well, we're going to think about what we're going to do this afternoon. I haven't quite decided just yet. I think we might try and find Tingana. And so while we do that, let's send you to and beyond Dingala and see how Eric's doing. Sounds like he's already started off with a bang this afternoon. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to and beyond Dingala. My name is Eric, and behind camera, as always, is Owen. This afternoon we've started off really well. We came down into the riverbed to see if we could find tracks of that leopard we heard rasping from this morning. Haven't found the tracks yet, so we're still on the search, but we do have this beautiful herd of elephants that is, that is next to the road over here, and they are just peacefully feeding in the area. There's a very small one that's hiding itself behind a bush quite effectively, but I'm sure it will show itself quite soon. It's actually... If you can see it there, it's using its trunk very effectively for such a youngster. See how it's lifting it up and it's scooping into its mouth again. That tree is called a magic quarry and I wonder if there's small little berries that it's after. Very, very sweet little berries that it might be trying to pick at. Otherwise, they don't usually eat a tree like that. I have just seen that there is another tree that it might be going after, actually part of the vaquilia or the acacia species so that might be more tasty than a magic quarry. You can only see the three of them. There's another youngster at the back. There's this adult female. She's scratching her ear. It comes a little bit closer. Might just move. Let's see if we can get into a position here. Especially with a youngster we just like to give them a little bit more space than what might seem necessary. But we've got a nice little gap here, I see. There we go. A better. Huh? Really nice. Now the youngster's right next to the, the mother. And Owen pointed it out a little bit earlier how petite looking those tusks of hers are. And they are nice and long, but they're very thin and very, very sharp and they grow straight down. The 
Looks like she's actually using her trunk to smell some good grass. She was walking, she stopped, and then she reversed a little bit. I'm sure she sniffed out some pretty nutritious grass that she's after. And, I mean, at this time of year, you wouldn't imagine them to really be focusing too much on grass. It's literally, uh, it's, a, it's a young sapling, that's what it is. It's not grass at all. And this is the time of year where their diet will completely change from feeding a lot on grass to mostly feeding on things like these young saplings on the bark of trees and pushing trees over and feeding on the roots even. And it's just amazing how she knew exactly what the smell was, that it was good to eat, and she just went straight for it. And I'm sure there are others around. It's quite dense around this area. So Kartek, are you asking if elephants use water as sunscreen? I don't think they, they use it as effectively as, as we do as, as sunscreen, but they'll use it to cool themselves down rather. And in that way, they, they protect themselves from the sun. So when on a very, very hot day, typically in summertime, you might even find a whole herd of elephants coming down to water to swim. And if they still feel that like they're, they're too hot, and what they'll do instead of water is actually within that, that little mud wallow or whatever that they're swimming in, they'll scrape up and get some nice mud to splash onto their body. And they'll use the mud rather than the water to protect their, their skin. So that mud creates quite a hard layer over their body. And as the sun dries it, it cracks or it dries up. And sometimes it will even get little ticks and parasites stuck onto that mud. And so it serves for a few different purposes. It's a nice protection from the sun, like you say, and then it also protects them, them from getting an over infested by ticks and parasites. There, that little one crosses the road. See the uh, a much bigger one in the back there. I mean, it's just the one adult and the the small one with the. See that one's got tusks. So I mean, probably in the region of three or four years old if I had to guess so it, it might even be the offspring of the one that we've just seen crossing and that's why they're so grouped together which which will mean that the whole herd is scattered through this area it's quite a dense area so we we're lucky to just see one or two of them crossing the road here but I think we'll probably leave these elephants they're going to go, go into an area where we can't see them anymore and from here just drive the riverbed see if we can find tracks of that female leopard and if not then eventually at around 4 35 o'clock we'll make our way back towards the pride and hope everyone's got their fingers crossed and holding thumbs that maybe we get to hear them calling like like myself and owen did this morning um, and hopefully we'll get to show you them calling so whilst we driving looking for tracks we'll send you across to Twali kalahari and we'll let david say hello for, to you this this afternoon Look at that beautiful. Oh, well, welcome back to Swale Kalahari. I, I, I nearly just started chatting off about the, the Roan bull over there, but Yandra and I are trying to find you guys some good stuff again. Um, it's it's a, actually a warm afternoon. Maybe not warm according to me. I mean, I've got I've still got a whole lot of layers on, but it's improving rapidly. Um, and this afternoon we've got some really, really cool stuff under our sleeves for you, but we're gonna, we'll keep you in suspense. I'm not going to give it away just yet. Um, but on the way to what we're actually planning on finding, we've got this beautiful little herd of springbuck and a roan bull in the background there. But we'll look at those animals. Eh? So it's mostly females in that herd. And you'll see they're stopping and feeding every now and again, heads down. And occasionally one of them will nibble a little bit higher up. They'll actually feed on grass when, when it is available and it's green. Um, but when it's dry like this, and you can see, I mean, there's, there's no green grass to speak of over here. Um, then they'll actually switch over to forbs and, and bushes more regularly. So those ones that are, you see that one that's feeding with its head down there. That's actually going for, there's still a number of, uh, like, forbs actually growing flat, flat, flat on the ground. 
and that gives them enough sustenance, you know, that'll actually tie them right through the right through the dry season feeding on things like that. Amazing how they like move as one as one body. Emma, the guide's favorite. My guide, my my favorite animal on safari. Wow, that is an incredibly difficult question to answer because I have so many favorites. Because every single species doesn't matter, and I'm including plants in this kind of thing, has something really special about it. Um, its unique survival strategies, the way it's evolved to cope with these kind of environments. Um, whether it's a spring bucket or, or a roan bull over there or a meerkat, um, or any kind of snake, or tree, or anything. I mean, every single one is special in its own way. So it's, I, I really can't answer that question and say, well, I have one favorite. Um, and guests often laugh at me because, uh, you know, I get that question, what's your favorite animal? And like every second one that I get to, oh, this is my favorite, and it's the coolest thing. It's like, well, uh, yeah, I, I, you know, I've just got so many favorites, so... Beautiful afternoon. So they're just carrying on feeding over there. Now these are probably going to end up sleeping um, down near the next set of meerkat burrows where the Macaulas used to be um, uh, this week. So I see their droppings and tracks have been around there a lot early in the mornings. So while they head on, we're going to head in a different direction and pass you over to David at Juma. How's it and welcome to your sunset safari on Juma. Speaking of sunset, the sun is still very high as you can see. I'm going to turn the corner then I can look at you without squinting. BK and I have just left camp and we are on a mission to find some exciting animals. My name is David Hancock. BK is going to be rolling the camera and together we're going to make a good team this afternoon. And by the way, a very, very happy birthday to Samuel. May you have a blessed year ahead. So this afternoon, we're going to quickly check the Muati and then head over in the direction of Treehouse Dam, where Tristan saw those buffalo and elephant this morning. See if we can relocate on them. Neil, you've asked what do animals usually do during their free time and you're from Virginia. Well, Neil, animals basically just survive and survival requires three things, water, food and shelter or protection, safety. So. They spend a lot of time eating, depending on what kind of animals they are. If they're herbivores, they eat cellulose, plants and leaves and roots and bark and grass, all sorts of things like that. So they've got to eat a lot of it to get good nutrition in. So they spend the majority of their day eating. And then that feeding, eating is kind of dictated by water areas. So then they'll move from water to water or back to the same water, depending on the species and then they require safety so they spend a lot of time working their way through different areas always on the lookout always aware of their surroundings if they're herbivores a little bit different for predators they don't eat as much because they get so much protein 
out of the food that they eat. So they spend a little bit less time eating, but a little bit more time hunting and a lot of time resting. So to answer your question, they survive. Speaking about an animal that spends a lot of time eating at the very, very top of the trees, let's send you over to Angala with a giraffe. We've just come onto the road that runs parallel to the river and we've got this beautiful, beautiful giraffe. He was, looked like he was threatening to move off, but he's, he's just stopped and now he's basically watching where it looks like his partner might have moved off to. He, we had such a nice close-up. He was feeding on a, on a knob thorn and then he, as we came, he lifted up his head and he was debating whether to, to move off or to stay feeding, but I think that his companions decided to move and so he's probably just going to stick with them and, and follow. He's got a very interesting pattern about a third of the way down his neck from his head. And there's a very distinctive change in color there. It goes from an, a pretty normal typical giraffe color to a very very dark color. And I wonder if this isn't maybe him and if you look at the, the top of his head he's still got quite a lot of hair around the top of his his horns or his ossicones which means that he's still quite young once he starts fighting more that hair is just going to fall off and his head will get much more lumpy so he's a, a young male in his prime i would say and and you know, more than likely going to start changing into a, a bit of a darker color and i wonder if it's not going to start from that little patch and work its way down its neck a nice view of it there very, very distinct. It's almost like a birthmark in a way. Mm. See if I can get another view before he goes again. He's moving over towards a tree now, which looks like he might start feeding, so we'll get a Hopefully an uninterrupted view for now. Seems like there's quite a nice little gap. If I reverse back just a little bit more. There we go. So he's walked past several different large green trees that I mentioned that and that elephant was feeding on and I thought well, it doesn't seem like it should be feeding on it and it walked straight towards the tree with nice long thorns on it. And these ones have actually got hook thorns. So all part of the acacia or the, the Vachelia or Senegalia family, much more nutritious, especially at this time of year. So that's where most of his energy will be put, is moving from these different types of thorn trees. <laughs> I find it quite interesting how he uses different techniques to feed on different trees. So this one now doesn't really have any thorns on, so he's quite comfortable to just use his, his tongue and lips and he gets his head right in there. If he was feeding on the, the thorn tree that we've just seen him leaving, he'll be a lot more delicate and precise. He'll use his tongue to wrap around small little branches or pluck with his, with his lips. And this one, you're getting right in there. Nandini, you asking why the skin of the giraffe looks like that? 
and it just i guess it's it in the the simplest way i think it just helps just like a, a lion i mean like a zebra's stripes or a leopard spots it helps break out the outline of the giraffe I've um, read some studies recently where they've they've been able to put thermal imaging cameras onto the giraffe and they've noticed that the the hotter parts of the giraffe are around those little hexagonal shapes and the cooler parts are around the white parts around it and so they think that there's quite a intricate series of veins and capillaries that are transferring the the blood from patch to patch to try and help the, the whole giraffe cool down its body. And one of the theories I read is that why, that's one of the reasons why they've evolved to have such a long neck, so they can have more of those patches and they can cool themselves down a little bit more. One of the nice things about the, the development in technology is you get to see these things that we, don't, we didn't get to see 10, 15 years ago. I mean, the, the, the um, thermal imaging cameras that we have nowadays are incredibly good. And so that we're picking up things that we wouldn't really have known 10, 15 years ago. So that's one of the studies I've read. I mean, I think breaking the outline, you might think it's, it would be something like that. But then again, giraffe, you find in open grasslands where it's pretty easy to pick out giraffe from a very distance, especially because of their shape. And you can see them from a distance pretty much in, in any habitat. Turning into the sun there nicely, and I don't know, I don't know if you saw that very long tongue. He almost licked his lips as he started feeding on that tree. Etienne's asking about the the huge bulb underneath its neck. And I'm not quite sure what you, you mean there, Etienne. I think, I mean, if, if anything, it might just be the, the shoulders and the, the chest of the giraffe, if that's the big bulge on the neck that you're talking about, or maybe the shoulder blade. Is that cool? I mean, it's, it's a lot more apparent now. I mean, at, at the bottom of the neck, there's that, that big little, or that, that, not the big little, the, that big hump. So that's basically where the, the neck ends and the back starts. So it's nice and thick there. And I mean, this male uses his neck to fight. Oh, thanks, Lundeka. So Londeka is just helping me then, and she's saying that it's, it's more than likely you're thinking about the Adam's apple of the giraffe, which is right at the, the throat and the, the jaw. And one of the amazing things with giraffe is when you're watching them feed like this, they chew and chew and chew, and then when they swallow, you can literally see the semi-digested food moving down the throat and it's a pretty good angle now for us to see it so if if we see it you have to look quite carefully sometimes and then that would be the the adam's apple basically moving the the semi-chewed stuff down into the first chamber of the stomach okay it stopped it's still chewing I don't know if, if the angle was particularly good there because he twisted a bit. It's very interesting. I mean, this is the fourth species of tree that we've seen him feeding on this afternoon. And this is a tree known as a, as a Tamburti tree, which a lot of people would probably recognize the name. And this tree's got, got latex in it, which is poisonous to people. But these giraffe like taking in the, the extra toxins. It helps break down the fiber, helps put in little, I guess, more bacteria to aid with digestion. Hmm. That neck, look at the angle.
angles of it, there's like a big kink in the neck about halfway along. Joel's asking where the rest of the giraffe are, and we saw this male with one other male giraffe, which I think he might be able to see. We don't have as high a vantage point, so we can't see him around. But Joel, males tend to be more solitary than females, and so they're quite happy to be by themselves. And what they'll basically do is meander around the area, and then if they see some females from a distance, They'll probably head over towards a group of females to see if there's any that might be ready to mate. And so you'll often see giraffe by themselves like this. I mean, even giraffe with youngsters or, or female giraffe will be by themselves sometimes. They don't really have a very fixed social structure like that herd of elephants that we saw. You know, there's the matriarch and then she's got her offspring and, and the, the herd is, is a very close-knit group. These giraffe will meander in and out, and if they see other giraffe, they'll come in and socialize for a bit, and then they'll leave again. So they're not really a true herd species or a true family. I think one of the main reasons is because these males will have to compete for females. And it is very, very taxing on their bodies, and you can see how long that neck is, and how big and, and robust those holes are. Yeah, so whilst we, we stick around this giraffe, I'm pretty sure we'll leave it within the next 10 minutes or so. But we will send you across to Juma and see what David's up to. Well, BK and I are trying to find some very angry sounding elephant. They have been trumpeting and screaming and going crazy somewhere here. We saw one of the bulls, but he didn't want to be seen. We had a look at him and he walked off. And now we're just trying to find the youngsters that are screaming. I'm assuming it's a youngster. Could be an adult. Who knows why they're screaming? There's so many reasons. Elephants are very diverse in their vocalizations and their emotions. But the bush is very thick here and I can't seem to find them again. I had a glimpse of the back of one on the other side, but they seem to have become ninjas. It would be very interesting to, I'm sure we'll find them. And then we'll see what the reason for their screaming is. Elephants, like I said, are very emotional and they, for no reason, sometimes trumpet and sometimes it could be a predator, sometimes one of the babies trips and falls and the mother gets a fright or be a number of things. So, always interesting to see what the cause of their agitation is. The best thing for us to do now is to just sit here for another minute or two and listen because they are close and we should hear another trumpet or maybe just some branches snapping as they feed or give away their location hmm. not hearing anything Eva, age nine, welcome to the show. You've asked, would elephants eat a banana? It's a very good question. I think they would. I had a banana this afternoon and it was delicious. So I can't see why an elephant wouldn't think the same. But I know from naughty elephants that have broken out of game reserves and gone to farms that their favorite is actually citrus, which is like oranges. Oranges are their favorite. They don't have to even peel their oranges, they just eat them whole. They really like oranges. Fruit is definitely a favorite of elephants and other animals out here that we call browsers, meaning they eat leaves and seed pods and fruits. Fruits are normally the sweetest thing they can find, so 
I'm sure a banana would also be tasty. Dominique from Canada, you're nine years old. Thank you for your question. You've asked what are elephant tusks made of? And they're made of something called ivory, which is a unique substance. It's quite similar to teeth, I suppose you could say. It's not keratin, which is like compressed hair. Ivory is much harder. And elephant tusks are unique in that. They're, I suppose you could call like hippo, those big hippo canines, ivory in, in a similar way, but I believe it's a little bit different than elephant tusks. Elephant tusks themselves are very hard. I'm not exactly sure what the compound or the chemical is called that makes it up. Maybe like dentine, like your teeth. But it is very hard, very heavy. Well, hopefully, oh, there's some ivory. Speaking of elephants, that looks like an elephant with big ivory. I just spotted him through the bush quite a long ways away. So give us about 10 seconds and we'll be able to give you a, sh a little look of him, a shot. Ivory is something that people have cherished for thousands of years. They used it in trading and unfortunately it le led to exploitation of elephants. But thankfully now in this area we've protected them and these guys are safe. Here's Mr. Elephant right in front of us. Just behind that tree. Now he's hidden his face. Let me just move a little bit. Lots of elephants, that's the cause of the noise. We're just going to sit here a bit and watch them and see if they're showing any visible agitation. If not, it was probably nothing. One of them got a fright or someone said something nasty to the other one. One elephant called the other elephant overweight. There's a youngster. Why don't we back up a little bit and go and see if we can get a better view. Let's have one more look here. Very cool. Glad we found them pays off sometimes to to use your your ears and just sit and listen a bit and try and locate the source of the sound Charis, he's seven years old and from the UK. It's a very pretty name. You asked what do elephants not like to eat? As you know, they're vegetarians, so they only eat plants. And what they don't like to eat? Um, Charis, there are some plants out here that aren't very tasty. Try and think of something. The cherries, they, they pretty much eat most vegetation out here, just they kind of pick and choose. So you get, for instance, with grasses, you get sweet grasses that taste really nice to elephants, and then you get sour grasses that aren't so 
tasty and they try and avoid those. Sometimes they will eat some of those sour grasses when it's bad conditions and there aren't any sweet grasses available. But uh, it kind of depends on their smell and their taste of the specific plant or tree or grass or fruit. I hope that answers your question. They love grass, they definitely don't love steak. And they love fruit. There's that ivory we were talking about earlier. This is still a young bull, so those tusks have still got lots of growing to do. They'll grow throughout his life. Most of the herd has moved behind us and they're heading to the road, so we're going to just back up out of here and see if we can have a nice look at the herd. While we're repositioning here to get a better look at these ellies, we're going to send you over to Swalu Kalahari for an update. Going live? So we got something really cool here. We were actually on the track of a snake. And while we were following these snake tracks, we happened to see this other really cool, cool little creature. I'm not going to go closer. I'm just going to point to this piece of grass. But have a look at a little grasshopper. But he's actually burying himself in the sand. Look at that. You see that? Look how he's covering himself with sand. Have you ever seen a grasshopper do that? That is absolutely remarkable. So these little guys actually use it as a form of camouflage um, in these very, very exposed open environments. Um, and they also lay their eggs under the sand. But I mean, look, as we're sitting here, he's just covering himself more and more and more and more. And he's not the only kind of animal that actually does that here. We've got a very, very special spider that lives in these areas. And if we are extremely lucky, we'll be able to find one for you. It's called a six-eyed desert crab spider. And that crab spider is a master of camouflage and it does exactly in almost the same manner that this grasshopper is doing it, covers itself with sand. But look at that, as we've been sitting here, that little guy's disappeared in front of our eyes. That is absolutely amazing. And in terms of spiders, remember I said that name was a six-eyed desert crab spider. If we find it, we're going to try somehow. I'll make a plan to actually show you that it's got six eyes. Um, it's so cool. It's so cool. But how's this grasshopper? Like right here, and it's disappeared. That is absolutely remarkable. It just shows you when you're out here, you have n no idea what you're going to be passing. You know, every step that you take, there can be something hidden, hidden around you. That's brilliant, eh? It just shows that the challenges that sand presents in terms of it gets super hot. I mean, the, the, the surface temperature can come like very easily reach 60 plus degrees centigrade. Um, and it, you know, we were saying the other day in terms of if you're a seed trying to germinate on this, it can be exceedingly difficult. But it also provides wonderful opportunities in terms of camouflage, because it's very easy to move it as a substrate. And thermoregulation, if you can get down a burrow, whether you're a snake or a meerkat or an artvark um, or a pangolin or anything that burrows, that thermoregulation function of the sand, that, that ameliorating effect of the sand is just brilliant. I mean, you can't even see this little guy anymore. You know, if, if you walked past there, you wouldn't say there's any, any living creature underneath there. Look at that. So. Wow. 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 Let's see what he does now. He's hiding. Look at that. So if I was a bird or a bird came hopping around here, just sits dead still, you wouldn't know. You could peck, 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 peck at grass, peck at grass, picking up seeds or even looking for ants or termites to eat. And that grasshopper just sits dead still. It doesn't move. And the bird would move on and the grasshopper remains.
Lindeka says it's tucking itself in for bedtime. <laughs> I can't think of anything worse than going into a sleeping bag full of sand. Imagine that. <laughs> well, I can kind of imagine worse things, but yeah, we'll stick with the sand. That's just incredible, eh? Wow. Ariel has just asked, how many gra eggs does a grasshopper lay? My answer to that is I have absolutely no idea. But tomorrow, this evening, I'm actually going to find out for you, and I will give an answer tomorrow. It'll be really interesting. And I think, I would guess, depending on the species, you know, if you've got smaller ones, they probably lay fewer eggs, and the larger ones probably lay, lay more. But I, I'm absolutely just going on a, on, a, on a wild guess there. I know... You get certain species that can lay a lot of eggs, um, and if you get numbers of those grasshoppers congregating in good years and laying eggs, they can actually hatch in masses, and then you get those huge swarms of locusts. Um, that can obviously be a big problem for agriculture in some areas. Um, we don't have those problems out here. You know, there's also just so many things in these natural intact systems that can eat them. But just how remarkable is nature? You just never know what you're going to find. Or if you don't know what you're looking for, what you're not going to find. <laughs> yeah. We're going to try carrying on finding the snake. It's going to be a long shot, but we never know. We won't tell you what snake it is. Um, we, we might give you, we might, I think we're going to show you the tracks and see if you can guess. But in the meantime, head over to David at Juma with his ellies. Wow. Welcome back. We just find a nice little gap here in the trees. Can you hear that audio? Some more elephant talking there. Just sitting here and watching them move by. This is a decent sized herd. I haven't got an account yet, but by the sounds and sights of it, it seems to be a pretty decent size. I'm not sure if this was the same herd that Tristan saw this morning or not. Lots of youngsters. Sammy, 10 years old, you asked what kind of animal would hunt an elephant? The only animal that hunt elephant on a semi-regular basis are lion prides. Not just one lion, it would have to be a large pride with very strong males. It's very uncommon in our area here, but in more arid regions that I know of, specifically in areas of Botswana. There are actually prides that specialize in the hunting of elephant. It just takes a very coordinated attack and they would generally single out younger or smaller animals. Mommy's coming to inspect us. Hey, we got no one Kinga with you. Why are you so angry? This mommy's got some serious attitude. See how she came to us with her head like that and that trot. Just checking us out, making sure that BK and I aren't going to do anything to her family. Ears out, being a bit menacing. said earlier a lot of emotion in elephants. She was clearly emotional about something.
I actually think that female that just walked past us is quite pregnant. She has a youngster there that's about the same, about the right age for her to be pregnant and she seems to be very large in the belly. Can't see her now, I'm gonna just move a little bit forward so that we can see her again. Perhaps that is the reason that she was so agitated. Mia, you're 10 years old, you've asked what, how smart are elephants? Elephants are pretty smart, Mia. They, they definitely remember a lot. They remember certain routes through the bush. They know how to find water. They often use the same paths for many years. In old days, when they used to migrate much further north, they used to remember the exact routes. And they also seem to remember if people have annoyed them in the past. They seem to develop certain attitudes and habits towards people based on their experiences with them. Maybe people have chased them out of camps or used loud bangs or scared them, then they develop a bit of an attitude. So they're intelligent in that they seem to remember things. I think there is something to that saying about an elephant's memory. But that being said, compared to their body size, they don't have the biggest brains. So, yeah, I don't think they're going to be doing any algebra equations. Hmm, there's another mommy behind us, came in to inspect. She's also a little bit uncertain. Well, it's officially end of kids session, so welcome to all the other viewers, wherever you may be in the world. We look forward to hearing from you. Please send in any questions you may have. Kids, you can also continue to send in your questions. Always lovely to get the questions. Chat a little bit about interesting topics of the bush. And remember, you can use that hashtag Wild Earth with your questions. That was very cute watching that little elephant. It's like he was doing the limbo, trying to get under that branch. literally sat here and had a whole herd of elephants go by us, one by one, each showing varying emotion, varying degrees of peace or agitation. We've gotten to experience the herd dynamic and the emotion of the animals, which is what it's all about. We are so privileged to be able to bring this to you. But as always, you can only do it with your support, your financial contribution. Please follow that link at the bottom of the page really appreciate it. And Dini, you've asked how many herds of elephants are there in Juma? Juma's not huge, so at any given time there's probably only two, maybe three groups of elephants on Juma. But throughout the whole greater Kruger region there are many, many herds, many thousands of elephants. Kruger National Park alone 
Probably has near 20,000 elephants by now. I'm not sure what the last count was. Obviously many herds that comprise of all those animals to come to that number. Medpol, you've asked which place in Africa, which country in Africa has the highest population of elephants. If I'm not mistaken, it would be Botswana. They've actually got an overpopulation of elephants. Which means that their landscape is rapidly changing. Trees and vegetation are changing very quickly. It is a very debatable topic if it's a good thing or a bad thing or if it's even an overpopulation or just the way the cycle is going but either way the vegetation in Botswana is changing very quickly it's becoming increasingly arid because of that very high population of elephants that have to eat so much to stay alive of a arid region, we're going to send you over to Tswalu Kalahari with a snake track. So here's the snake track that we were chatting about earlier. Um, any guesses as to what it is? I'll put my fingers next to it, or my hand next to it, and then you, it gives you some kind of idea of the width of the snake. Okay, so it's the side of the track is from there to there so it's not particularly big but it's not a very small snake either um, I'll give you another clue it's not doing a lot of sideways motions you know a snake a larger snake often does that kind of movement um, this one's not doing that what you're going to battle to see from this is the direction. So we, you know, we've gone through a couple of things here, and we can see the way the sand, of, of, like over here, that little line there. So the sand has been pushed in that direction, which means that the snake is traveling that direction. So I know it's difficult from here, but if there's any guesses as to what kind of snake this is, um, Feel free to chip in at any time. I'm not going to tell you, but we're going to actually carry on. I'm going to, it's going into this little patch of bush over here. Um, so I'm going to walk around it and see, because this is going to be quite a fun tracking exercise. And we're going to walk around it, see if the tracks come out the other side, and then we'll just carry on from there. All right, but if, if you want to give any suggestions as to what snake this might be, feel free to chip in. Obviously with a snake, you don't want to go ferrets around. Ah, oh, my word. That, that was way too easy. So, viewers that said, Puff Adder, you're all spot on. Very well done. I think I'm just going to go home now and just relax the rest of the day because you guys have got this. No, but you're 100% right. It is a Puffy, a Puff Adder. Um, it's not a huge one, but it's, uh, you know, it's not too small. I've no idea what size it is, actually. But um, going on the tracks, it's, it's average. So, I'm just going to go around and see if we can pick up the tracks on the other side. They love these kind of thickets and these clumps. Um, but we'll, we'll have a look here now. I don't want to obviously walk through there because these puff adders are ambush predators. Not that they're going to eat me, but you know, they'll be, if they're lying up, they're going to be lying dead still and they won't be lying in the open. So it'll be in any, any one of these bush clumps somewhere. So, you know, I won't walk through them. I'd rather go around first. a lot of giraffe that have been walking up and down here feeding on this tree. And 
And you can... <laughs> Hannah, hopefully one day it'll be a mamba. You've got to be one of the very few people I've ever heard say that. And I'm one of the other few people that have, uh, that'll say that. I absolutely love black mambas. I equate a black mamba, you know, in terms of reptiles, as the same as a shark in the ocean or a, a lion in the bush, you know, or a, a wolf. You know, it, it's like these big apex predators and they absolutely critically important for environments and out here it, it tends to be things like cape cobras and puff adders but black mambas are just magnificent snakes and i personally welcome the day that we find them here but we have haven't found any yet but yeah we'll 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 keep our eyes open okay i'm not seeing i'm not seeing anything coming out here so what i'll do is and I could have missed the tracks. I mean, that's, that's especially with my eyesight. But um, I'll do a, a one more quick walk around and then I'll start going slowly inside here and see if we can find this little guy. Like I say, lots of giraffe tracks up and down here. We're not going to worry about those. This is where it gets fun because I'm not seeing anything coming out. We've got a nice set coming in. So somewhere in here, and it's not a big, it's not a big clump of bush. It's actually a very small clump of bush. Um, so in theory, unless I've missed the track, that snake is somewhere inside there. It, it obviously won't be up a tree. Puffy is, I've seen them climb onto low bushes to sun themselves, but um, 10 to 1 is probably going to be on the ground here somewhere. That side of the bush clump is very, very open, the far side. It's, there's just one scraggly little bush, so it's unlikely to be there. We're not seeing anything over here. Um, so it's probably, I don't know where this, this bush here is, further that direction there. I think while we're looking for this, um, head over to Tristan, because this might take a while. Over here, I mean, I, with a puff, I don't want to like, rush in here. So head over to Tristan, and let's see what they got on that side, and then we can, we can, uh, you can join us again on, on our treasure hunt here. Well, I'm sure there'll be lots of little treasures for you to find. Dylan seems like Dylan loves to find treasures all over the place. At the moment, I'm trying to track Tingana. It seems like he met up with Clalumba at some point in the drainage um, last night or early this morning. From where we found her and she came out is exactly where his track goes. Now, I need to ask a very big favor of all of you watching that watch the dam cam is to keep a, a very, very keen eye out on the dam wall because his last track just pops just over the dam wall, so it's probably why he wasn't seen last night. He came down the dip, and then he just came up onto the edge of the top of the dam wall on the far side, and then dropped in behind it. Um, and it looked like he was down there, and then Clalumba came, and then I can't see where he's gone. The grass is too long. But when I came into this area earlier, there was these impalas, and they were super skittish. They were just kind of like sitting, and then as soon as I got anywhere near them, then they would just run a little bit, and then they would stare in the drainage. And I went down there, and I've looked, and I've walked, and I've tried to see if I can find and pinpoint exactly where he's gone but the track just goes into this long grass area and I can't see a thing um, it's not to say that he isn't sitting right there I have this sneaky feeling that he could be lying up and I've walked past him in one of those dense 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 thickets behind the damn wall there's these little clustered thickets and if he gets into that unless you know he's there you won't see him at all even if you drive right past him so we know he likes to do that. Um, we've seen it with him multiple times where he gets into these little kind of roundish thicket areas and all you see is a spot. Um, and that's when you follow him in there. So if you haven't seen him go in there, it's very tricky. Um, but that's fine. We at least kind of know that he's around here. I have seen no tracks going out towards quarantine, nothing coming out of Twin Dam. So now I'm just checking further south down the Mulawati in case he's down this side and I would really like to find him today because 
it would just be nice to spend time with him. I was reminded today of a, of a, a very special day last year this time, um, where Osana arrived back at Juma. We saw him this day a year ago, um, coming back into Juma. And then Pat had him with Tingana and was it Clalumba in that sighting? I can't remember. I just remember us being on foot and tracking him and Rickson was very upset <laughs> that we didn't find him on foot. Um, but it would be nice kind of fitting way to find Tingana because I know he was with Hosanna that day um, and we know that he obviously is related to Hosanna so it just seems like a good day to find him. Um, but I suspect he's here somewhere. I don't think he's gone far to be honest with you. I think he's somewhere in this area. There's no tracks indicating that he's walked anywhere else other than into this drainage line. So I am hoping as it cools down a little bit, we'll start to see him. I mean, it's not exactly hot today, so, you know, he should be moving, but it's Tingana. He's a little bit older, so he spends a lot of time sleeping. Okay, come on, Tingana. Up you get. We're going to need him to put his head up, though, unless he's right next to the track, because we won't spot him otherwise. Daniel, you say you remember that day very well. It was very cool. We managed to find him coming out of Londolozi that day, walking straight north on Triple M. And then we thought he might make it by the afternoon, but more likely the next morning. And, um, don't worry, Alex is dangerous. Um, he, he actually made it by that afternoon. He, he walked pretty quickly and pretty far to get to where... Um, to back to Juma and then just straight into the, the middle of Juma and then chaos um, as normally was associated with Osana as he found all his friends again on the first day he arrived back um, which is what we want today we're <laughs> going to hope that he Tingana is around and then that Hosanna makes an appearance imagine that imagine Hosanna back on Juma I mean it's very unlikely and in all honesty I would not even wager one rand, let alone one dollar or pound, um, on Hosanna appearing on Juma today. Um, but stranger things have happened at stranger times, so one can never say never. It would be an absolute miracle, though, if he arrived back on Juma, I can tell you that much, for a young male leopard to come back here when he's mating and scent marking and those kinds of things, there's almost zero chance of that happening. All right, here we go. We're going to check this entire um, Milawati system, all the little tracks that I know Tingana has walked many times before. So while I do that, I'm going to send you back to Eric. I believe he's also tracking. Hopefully between the two of us, we'll have some luck. We, we're driving so slowly now just to, to see if the, that pride of lions might have moved off from this morning. And I just had the thought of, of us maybe going there a little bit earlier than I initially thought for the afternoon. And the reason being is I don't want us to run out of time. I don't want it to get too dark. When we get there, they've moved off, and then it takes us a, a lot longer for us to find them. It's been a very cool day today. The wind has been blowing a lot. And so it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's good to just get there early. If they're sleeping and not doing anything, then we can potentially go back there a little bit later. But it's nice to just find them and know exactly where they are. So we are taking a, I don't think there's any particular rush for us to get there. So we're taking a nice drive. I mean, there's some beautiful, maybe we can just quickly look at, at a couple of these birds that are on the ground. There's quite a variety of them. Are we doing their own? One bird in particular that is very striking. The metallic blue colour that I'm sure Owen will get to right now. There it is. Just look at it and the, the sunlight is just catching it so beautifully. So as it lifts up its head, you'll see it doesn't have any eye colour, or at least a dark eye with a, quite a dark ear covert so basically from behind the eye to the bill and a long tail it's a starling called a virtual starling and you often find it on the ground so it's feeding on 
little seeds and insects that it might be finding. And I just love the way the colors change. If you can, see if you can look around, I mean, from the, the light turquoisey blue from the top of the head, all the way down to this violety color on the wings. It's not going to, as soon as it turns, if it turns from right to left or something, we might see that beautiful color. It's not going to give it to us. A little bit of the color there now at the very, very tip of the wings, if you can see it. Very busy this afternoon trying to feed up before it gets too dark for it to be active. We've got another bird that's slightly further to the right of it, which, which I'm sure most people would be able to, which would be able to recognize. It's called a blacksmith lapwing. Oh, awesome. It sounds like back up at Swalu Kalahari, there might be the animal that you've spent a bit of time tracking there. So let's go across to Dylan and see what he's found. So we're very, very lucky. We actually managed to track the snake down. I was a little bit skeptical. I must say that's my skeptical side coming out there as to whether we would actually get it. But look at that camouflage. Yeah. That is one of the more venomous species that we get here. Um, and it's just lying there dead still, absolutely no threat to us. As it's lying there, it's relying on its camouflage to escape any kind of predation, including any threat that we might present to it. And as you can see, I'm now lying probably a meter away from it. It's not budging, it's not doing anything, it's not being a threat to me. And that just shows you, yeah, these things have, you know, we've got very, very little to worry about with these snakes. They are ambush predators. So this puff adder could lie there for days on end sometimes, not necessarily in the same spot, but within that same, the same little bush clump, maybe just coming out, getting a bit of sun, going back in, going out, coming, getting a bit of sun. And Debbie, it does elicit the response of, of response of yikes. I uh, can't agree with you more, and never more so when you come upon them unexpectedly. Um, this one was quite nice and relaxed because you know we were we were aware of the snake tracks. We had been following it. We were, you know, we got to a point where we had circled the bush. We knew, okay, well the snake's in here somewhere. Then it was just a matter of actually pinning down exactly where it was. But the yikes part comes in is when you're walking along. Uh, money owned business and suddenly there's a puff adder. Um, in all my years in the, in, in the bush, and it's, it's a couple, um, I've yet to have a near call with a puff adder to say, oh, well, gee, sh that thing could have bitten me or almost bitten me. Um, you know, they, they really... major part of nights out in these environments. But what's going to be really fun with this snake over the next couple of weeks, and you know, I'm not going to make any promises, but we're going to try. Um, apologies, we, we, I just had a, a bit of a breakup on my comms there. Um, what Yandre and I are going to try to do over the next couple of weeks, this puff adder in a straight line from where we're sitting now is only about 100 meters from where the meerkat burrow is. So every time we come up here, we're actually going to see if we can follow this little guy and see where it's going, what it's up to. And obviously we're going to involve you guys and um, it'll be quite a fun journey with a snake. And you'll see how far is it moving. It's the middle of winter or approaching the middle of winter. The days are mild, but the nights are extremely cold. Um, and let's follow the snake and see what he gets up to. And I would just like to point out that on this journey of discovery, Melanie is joining us. Rashi, yeah, absolutely. Snakes in winter, um, they tend to be a lot less active, but they're still around. So 
We've got no species here that actually would hibernate, um, but certainly just very, very low periods of activity. So, and again, it really is dependent on the, the, the ambient temperature. If you're getting very warm days in winter, which we can get, um, then snakes can become, move, can become active and move around a lot. Um, if it's these cooler days like we've had for the past three days, um, they're obviously going to be a lot less active. But yeah, certainly snakes and other reptiles are definitely around and about in winter. How exciting is this? Eh? Here we're sitting, lying, close to a predator, a, a real hardcore predator, with no danger to ourselves. They, it's not presenting any threat to us. And in itself, it doesn't feel threatened. You know, it's just lying there dead still. And um, there's a good lesson there. You know, they have their place, as do we. And there's no reason why things like this can't, that we can't co-inhabit with them, you know, peacefully. So I think we're going to head over to the meerkats, and um, let's leave this little, this little snake to do what it does best. And we'll take Melanie with. We're going to move over to the meerkats. Uh, like I said, the burrow system is very close by her. And I think join David with his elephants. That should be some good viewing down that side. Moved around to have another look at these elephants. What is in the sky there, BK? It's like storks. Can you zoom in there on us? Sorry, we just temporarily gonna look at these storks. This is quite interesting. I'm not look at the elephant for a second. I'm just gonna get my binoculars out and see if we can see what kind of storks they are. Those marabous. Looks like marabou stalks. I can only really see one. Interesting. Maybe they're landing there. Maybe there's something to eat. We will go check that out as soon as we've spent a bit more time with these elephants. Elephant. Very difficult to get a, a number on this herd. They're so spread out. And it's very thick here. Very windy. Sorry if you're getting a bit of wind in the mic there. This cold front has brought a little bit of wind. I think Tristan and I are both in long pants this afternoon. Not two pairs of shorts as done in the Friday start. When can baby elephants start using their trunks? That's a good question, and it makes me smile to think about it. They really are cute to watch when they're young because they it's, they don't really know how to use their trunks. It's very funny. It's like flopping around something like an appendage they're not quite used to, and it takes them a while to really get to grips with it. 
flop it around. Sometimes I've even seen elephants, when they're very young, will actually drink with their mouths. They'll, obviously they suckle with their mouths, but I've even seen them drink at water holes, at dams, and with their mouths and not with their trunks. Just one second, I'm going to talk to Tristan on the radio. Here we go. Yeah, send. Oh, where exactly are you? Ah, uh, Twin Dam's red. Yeah, AFM, I'm about to go in there now. Look like Marabou's there. They're all landing just on the uh, eastern side of the drainage. Copy that, or oh, maybe there's good news. Um, I'll go have a look now after the segment. But. Sorry for that little interruption there. We're talking about those very cute baby elephant trunks. I wish we could see one right now that we could chat about. But I've only really seen them start successfully using their trunks. Probably I'm trying to think back now, maybe six months to a year where they really start coming to grips with it. Elephants are slow growing and slow to develop like humans. Well, the good news is those Storks were marabou's, Tristan confirmed that I couldn't really get a good look, but he also saw them landing and that generally means that there may be a kill because marabou's actually like to eat meat. So we're going to head straight on there and that's right in the Moati where Tristan's been following up on Tingana. So let's go have a look see and see what we can find. While we do that, we're going to send you over to Ngala with Lion. So my worries of those lions getting up and moving were not really anything to worry about because they've moved a total of maybe 20 meters the whole day. It does seem like they've found a, a really nice little patch that they all seem to be enjoying the sun. And I think all of the lions that we saw this morning are here. The only one that I haven't seen is that young female that we know who has cubs somewhere along this riverbed and so i would imagine that sometime throughout the day she might have gotten up and oh, there's a line starting to get up a little bit big stretch <laughs> i'm sure after a long day in the sun the sand will be nice and warm and we've got quite a strong breeze blowing here and it's quite chilly so it might have just gotten up and tried to move to a nice warm patch of sand to warm up a little bit. So I think she, that young lioness has probably started making her way towards where the cubs are at the moment. And like I said this morning, uh, probably about 1.5 kilometers away. <laughs> Jeez, Frog, you're saying a carpet of lions here. Yeah. Uh, if we get a, an aerial view of them, there would just basically be one long line of lions almost touching one another. A couple that are slightly separate, so there's one in the foreground a bit closer to us. And there's one right at the back that I can just see the top of its head. But it does look like it might be starting to make its way here. So there's that lioness. And completely contrasting to what we had this morning. I mean, they are flat. They've expended so much energy playing around with one another. I'm sure they're all pretty exhausted and enjoying this nap in the afternoon sun. Just after we left the giraffe, we 
did find tracks of a male leopard, and it could have been the one that we heard rasping this morning. He started heading in an easterly direction. So like I said, the, the, the track started to head east and, and out of our property. And so I think what we'll end up doing is whilst we're waiting for these lions to get active, we'll probably not move around here and, until it gets dark. So we'll send you across to Tristan and see what bird he has. That marabou stalks, which are the same stalks that Dave saw when he was looking at them, I was right underneath them and saw them kind of coming down to land. Now some of them are, have landed on dead trees, some on the ground. I'm just going to try and see what's going on here. Now with marabou stalks, the reason why it's always interesting to check around is because they are scavengers that eat off quite big carcasses. If you go up to the migration in East Africa, these guys are with the, the vultures all the time and they land and they eat land and they eat carcasses just as much as the vultures do so when you see flocks of them kind of landing it's always worth just checking out just in case you never know but in saying that at this time of the year often they do flock together and you find them kind of just walking through the grass trying to find food and looking for food it's not necessarily indicative of a big carcass and um, it, it could be but it's not always the case so we're just going to check it out and just see what's going on and, and figure out why exactly they're here but while we kind of have this one sitting very nicely with us i wanted to chat about its effective cooling system not that it would need a cooling system at this time of the the year yeah, it's a cold day today so we wouldn't have to worry but if you look at their legs you notice their legs are white and that's because they poo on their own legs so as they they defecate on their legs um the urea which is the white part of a bird's um poo kind of gets stuck and what happens is, is as they poo the wetness of that and the wind blowing it cools those bare legs which don't have any scales cools that down and then helps to cool the bird down remember these guys are big birds lots of feathers and so in the hot summer months they need a way to be able to just kind of keep their body temperature in check and and that bare head as well as those legs covered in that um, uh, urea just helps with being able to kind of cool them down um, quite quickly and, and effectively. They really aren't the prettiest birds, obviously. Um, they, they have this heinous head. Um, it's, it's pretty rough when you see them up close. Uh, I, in, in the Serengeti, you have the pleasure of getting them within a meter of where you are. And the worst part about it is those heads are generally covered with blowflies. It's quite something when you see them walking and there's just flies all over their face and they smell like rotten meat and really just not something that you would want to be close to um really, really not great one thing i will say though is they have the most incredibly beautiful um, wing feathers which you don't see from afar but if you get close enough to them and the sun hits them it almost looks like little puffy clouds on their feathers um obviously dark colored ones but they have these kind of little circular shapes and there's a little bit of a sheen to them actually really really pretty wings it's just the head and kind of legs that make them look not so pretty at all. But let's just investigate what's going on here. Let's see if we can find the rest of them. I see some more are up the road a little bit. So I'm gonna try and just find them quickly um, and see what they, they get up to. Not common for us to see flocks of these guys. They're generally one or two. Um, we don't we don't see big groupings of them regularly at all so to see as many as we're flying is quite interesting and you can see in the tree up here lots and lots and lots of them sitting in the tree why are you guys all here what would you be doing in this area the times that I've seen them flock like this is normally on big open clearings when there's an explosion of frogs or an explosion of insects that they can potentially go after like locusts which we haven't really had this year, so I don't know what would have drawn them to this section. Right, I just want to get round here quickly and show you. There's lots of elephant tracks here, but they're not down on the ground. Most of them are in the in the trees. Okay, it sounds like David has got his elephants. Sounds like they're crossing the road, so before they disappear, let's send you across to him.
Tristan, there are lots more elephants coming to join you. They are slowly heading in that direction. Just crossing the road here on their way down to the Muwati. I hope that something has attracted those marabous. As you may know, they are primarily scavengers and often a good indicator of a kill. But they could also just be going down to roost. We are completely surrounded by elephants. There's a bit of a thicket on our right, but you can hear them all around us. Stragglers. Fortunately, the sun's just a bit bright there. Here's a better look on the other side as they come past us. Very windy afternoon. Beautiful. What a lovely almost said zebra crossing, elephant crossing, you know what I mean. Well, let's send you back over to Tristan and see what he's found with those marabous. As you can see, this is the rest of the flock of these marabous, um, all kind of sitting in one tree. And what it looks like is it just looks like a, a basically a colony of them that's potentially fledged from the nest. So lots of young ones in amongst uh, that grouping. They don't have the quite bright pink neck yet. It's still a sort of gray coloration. Um, so I don't think there's anything here that we need to be investigating. Uh, we'd need to see signs of vulture and um, tawny eagles, battalier eagles, and that would be then a good indicator of of a carcass and with those absent and just these guys I think it's just that this is a, just a group of, of marabous that had been probably breeding in the same area they often build their nests together and have these colonies where they raise chicks and it's at this time of the year that the chicks would have fledged now and they're going to go off and start looking for places to feed and might just be passing through but nice to see them I know that I know they're not pretty birds and certainly not everyone's favorite but they are incredibly interesting in their ability to feed the way that they do i mean they eat like i was saying flesh and rotten meat as well as being able to hunt things like fish and and, and frogs and all those kind of things so they're pretty diverse in that aspect and just their size is unbelievable you know if you think about how big that bird actually is it's really quite something to see them flying through the sky um, i always think that it's kind of defies gravity in in some cases um, these guys are, are heavy, uh, big wingspan, so you know it's a, it's not a not a small bird by any stretch of the imagination. I think they weigh somewhere around six seven kilograms, uh, maybe even more than that, which is heavy for a bird. Most birds are incredibly light; otherwise, flight wouldn't be possible. So to have that big beak and those heavy set wings uh, requires a huge amount of energy for them to to get up there. Um, 
and like I say, hugely efficient at their at their job. Now, if you go into places like Nairobi, these are ex, these are guys are um, very, 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 very common. They hang around all the dumps and the abattoirs and things like that, and you kind of see them in the city, which is pretty crazy. Uh, here in South Africa, it's not quite like that. Um, Karen, you're asking if their beaks are strong? They are strong. It's actually really interesting. When we were in the Serengeti, because we could get so close, you could actually really hear how that beak works. And it almost has a sort of wooden sound to it when it hits together, um, like taking two wooden planks and hitting them. And so that beak has got a fair amount of force in it um, when it closes. But more than that, it's the ability for it to kind of stab that it's got. Um, you can see that is a very conical beak that ends in this quite sharp point. Um, and so they're able to kind of stab things out. And then when they eat carcasses, what they generally do is target the innards of a carcass. So they're not ones that will tear flesh off like the vultures. The vultures have that hooked raptor type beak. These guys kind of will go in and they'll just stab and get a chunk of meat or a, a little bit of the innards. And then they shake it and they swallow it pretty whole. And it fills up that big crop that they've got. Now, if you look at most of these birds, they don't actually have big crops at the moment, which is also indicative of the fact that they're not feeding on something here. If they were here and there was something and they were disturbed and they'd flown up and then landed again, we would have found that their crops would have been quite large. And I'll try and show you what I'm talking about. Here we go. There's a good picture of it. Um, so if you have a look at this particular individual, you'll notice how full they can get on those crop areas. Our ones are not quite like that. They're like this. You see this one is kind of empty, and then you get that when it's all filled up with meat and various other things. And very common to see them sitting like this, actually. Um, a lot of storks do sit uh, this way, which is pretty weird um, <laughs> to see. All right, Maribus. We're going to leave you guys to it and let you carry on with your day. We've got Tingana duty to continue um, looking for him. I actually just want to quickly shoot up to Buffalzook Dam in case Clalumba has come around that way. Although it sounded like she walked quite far north. The guys were telling me that they didn't see her after we left her, but they found her tracks and they were still going north on a road called Sour Plum, which takes you quite deep into Buffalzook, but it might be worth just checking the dam. She might have done a loop during the course of the day. All right, while I do that though, let's send you across to Swalu Karahari, see what Dylan's up to, no doubt up to no good off of his vehicle uh, at this stage. So we're still waiting for this female to come out again. Um, she pops into the burrow, out the burrow, in the burrow, out the burrow. Um, obviously the pups are okay in that. Um, but you know, it could be quite a long wait again, or she could literally pop out in the next 30 seconds. Um, but this is what it's about eh? for these babysitters, you know, that, that con constant vigilance. Um, or what's happening over there, but it's... Um, Just saying that you know if the if the meerkat goes down the burrow, the babysitter. Yeah, we're gonna control until we. Does that help? Um, yeah, if she goes down that burrow, you know it could, it could also be that you can get a, a predator coming in another entrance, like a snake. And if the if that burrow is connected underground, of there, obviously we don't know that. Um, but you know, she'll just keep on checking, coming out, checking, coming out. Um, I'm hoping that the rest of the clan that have been out foraging actually come back fairly soon. I've no idea what time that will be. Um, when it was very cold and windy the other day, they were actually back by this time already. They arrived back an hour earlier than today. So it's just going to be... And they could actually come from any direction. So keep your eyes peeled. In the background, you might see them popping up. Let's just sit and wait and see what happens over here. That snake that we were looking at earlier, that puff adder, straight line from here, from these burrows, is about 150 yards um, north of us. So it's very, very close. And that is a species that these meerkats will mob if it comes close to these burrows.
it's very, very commonly encountered puff headers going down and coming out. Tree frog has just asked an interesting question as well. Do meerkats get mange or can they get mange? Absolutely, meerkats can get mange. I've, again, that's just my own personal experience. I've never seen that on swallow, but it's certainly not impossible for them to get mange. Eh? Um, and obviously you get different kinds of mange. Some are a lot more um, contagious than others. Um, but yeah, I've never seen that on swallow. We have seen the odd other animal, notably things like jackal. Uh, but very, very, very infrequently. It's, it's not a, certainly not a common, uh, common uh, ailment out in these areas. So peaceful sitting in now. When I'm not talking. I'm actually, I feel like a meerkat. I feel like sunning myself here. It's nice and warm now. There's a bit of a breeze picking up, but it's not bad. I, I would guess probably around about 22, 22, 23 degrees centigrade. I must work on my maths, my conversion to Fahrenheit. That's probably going to help. Don't see any sign of, of the rest of the clan yet, but we're just going to wait it out over here. Um, so head over to Eric at Ngal and follow up on what they got there. These lines haven't moved at all actually they've seriously been enjoying the afternoon sun we are starting to get to the time of day where you know, if they were to be wanting to move they'll start showing signs of activity and so that's why we decided to just stick it out and be patient and one of the things that both uh, owen and i are most looking forward to is i mean they were calling this morning and we think that we heard another one calling in the distance and it could be the brother of one of the dominant males and I mean if, if they start calling it will be an absolutely incredible sighting so I think it's worth just being patient and sticking and sticking it out See that, that male line that Owen had was it looks like he's the most comfortable he's been in the last couple of weeks and I'm sure he's very grateful to have familiar faces around him a couple of stretches every now and again going on. See the one of the white paws just sticking behind the other one there. And again, such a unique perspective because we don't really get to see them sleeping at eye level like this. We usually look down at them. And so it does provide quite an interesting shot. Pretty much the whole riverbed now is covered in, in shade and so the sun is just going to start setting. We'll lose most of the sun and then from there it'll be nice to see if we get some activity from them. Uh, Kira, that's a, an, a good question. Uh, what is the ideal temperature for lions or what is a good one? And I think with lions the cooler the better generally. I think it does get to a point, you know, if it's too cold, they, they won't want to move around too much. And that's why I think they, they've decided to warm up in the sun. But I guess, you know, if in the, the teens, so between 10 and 20 degrees Celsius is, would probably be ideal conditions for them. I think a, another factor which will actually help cool them down a, a bit more is the wind. And they really, really do enjoy moving around during windy periods of the day. And the reason being is it's just so easy for them to go unnoticed. Or it's much easier than it is if it's a still day. Because, I mean, the wind starts swirling around. It takes their scent in different directions. It muffles their noises as they're walking through the long grass. 
And so it's quite easy for them to sneak up towards something that they're wanting to hunt. And so they are, if it's a cool, windy night, there's a very, very good chance that they might try and, and hunt something. Oh, big stretch. <laughs> Even covering her, her eyes. So we've stuck around and we've, we have had a very good count and I think uh, that lioness who's got the two cubs has moved away. We we're so hoping that maybe she was going to introduce the rest of the pride to the cubs, but they're still maybe a little bit too young. Jim, yes, they, they mostly hunt at night time, but they are very opportunistic and so they will hunt pretty much whenever they get a good opportunity. And these lionesses, the one that's in frame at the moment, she is a very old, experienced lioness. If you look at her nose, it's completely black. She, if you can't really quite see it now, but she's starting to lose a little bit of, of that beautiful tawny color. And it's becoming slightly more gray, especially behind the ear there. And she's in the region of about 14 years old. And so she's incredibly experienced. And she'll probably know the best conditions to hunt. So her and her sister are the two lead females. And they'll just direct the rest of the pride. And, and you know, if they've got a good opportunity or they've got a direction that they want to move in, the rest of the pride will just follow. I mean, it's, it's not too uncommon for us to see lions hunting in the daytime. And... It's just what I was going in towards, you know, if the conditions are good, if it's cool, if it's windy, if they've got a good opportunity, then they'll, they'll definitely try their luck. But because the male's just picked up his head, the, the young male's just picked up his head to have a look, probably at that one last female. Oh, he's looking so regal, that mane is starting to develop really nicely. Still missing a lot of mane behind his ears and on the top of his head there. So quite a lot of stuff to grow. And this is just what we were wanting to see. You know, there's a little bit more activity. There's a few females that are, are rolling around and stretching. That male's got his head up. And hopefully, you know, they, they start noticing each other getting active. And so they'll probably hear each other rolling, maybe hear the yawn every now and again. And then all of those will be little signs and triggers for the rest of the pride to continue getting active. We've got a, a question from FC, if I'm not mistaken, asking how long it will take for the mane to completely develop and grow. And it will usually be in the region of about four and a half to five years when that mane is looking really nice. And I mean, when they're six, seven years old, that mane is, is really big and, and beautiful. It, it does vary. The size of the mane does vary. I mean, the, the dominant males that we have in this pride have got relatively small manes and quite short manes. I've seen lions with, with much bigger and longer manes. So yeah, it, it just depends. But from, uh, from the age of about five years old, their, their mane generally is pretty good. Another view. So we, we spent a bit of time looking at that one lioness who was sleeping, and this is her sister. And she's just picked up her head again. And again, very, very dark nose can just see in her face it's just got lots of experience and so she's just picked up her head for the first time this afternoon head slightly up you can see it's testing the wind maybe trying to pick up on any type of scent or anything like that they tend to walk into the wind so that they can smell anything up ahead of them and then also their scent kind of goes behind where they're going nice yeah she's looking beautiful and just look at how strong she is i mean those shoulders are absolutely ginormous it's got so much muscle a striped horse you're asking what the probability of a white lion giving birth to a white cub and i mean it's, it depends on the father. So if the father's got the gene, then it's, I would say it's a, it's a very, very strong possibility. If a white lion 
male mates with a white line female, the cubs are going to be white. If it's a tawny male that has got the gene, uh, got the white gene, and mates with a white female, there's still a chance of the, the cub becoming a tawny, but it's probably a greater chance of it becoming white. If it's two tawny lines that have got the, the recessive gene, it's about a 25% chance of um, them giving birth to a white cub. We only realized that they, they had the gene, or at least we started figuring out that they, they could give birth to white lines in 2018. And we've been with this pride, or the pride has been with us at least, for at least uh, 10 years. So, like I said, the signs are looking good. There's a few more rolls around, there's a few more stretches, there's a few more yawns, so we're not going to be going anywhere. Hopefully we get the whole pride roaring in the next couple of minutes. <laughs> so in the meantime, whilst we're waiting for that, we'll send you across to Tsali Kalahari. Guys, this is super cool. The, the pack has just, just, just arrived back. Literally, like a minute ago, has arrived back. So now they're just checking the burrows. The alpha female was in the front. She's just gone down that burrow where the second one's gone down now. And then the youngsters, these are youngsters from the previous season. You see the tail up. They're actually very, very aware of our presence. But they're not worried about us. And the babysitter's still underground. So this is super, super cool that we were actually... That privilege to be here when they came back. Obviously a critical time for the group at an approach to the burrow. It's a wide open space. They're vulnerable to predation. And they don't know what's happened at the burrow system during the time that they've been out foraging. If for all they know, there could have been something that went wrong here. A caracal could have grab the babysitter or an eagle or there could have been an incident with a snake so obviously when they get back they're very very nervous looking carefully but you can actually hear them below the ground well I can hear them from where I'm sitting below the ground I think the thumbs up has been given the mother would have gone or the matriarch would have gone down to suckle them And Penelope, quite correct, their features are delicate, very finely built animals, and yet also very robust. Um, I've actually found a number of um, meerkat skeletons over the years and years that I've been in the Kalahari, um, and those have normally been around large raptor nests, ones that have been eaten, and their, their bone structure in their skulls are, are very robust. As one would expect, you know, they they being predators. But long faces, almost like, almost dog-like faces. See the matriarchs down with the babysitter, and the male. They're all down below there, just checking that everything's okay. And she'll obviously suckle him now. You know, she's just got back. They'll be a little bit hungry. I know I'm probably out of frame, but I'm not going to move because I want to disturb them as little as possible until I know the others have come out again and that they're happy that everything's fine. Jennifer, you say you love them. I love them too. And who can't love a meerkat? They are absolutely adorable. Barbara, meerkats, that's, um, meerkats can have more than one litter, yeah? Um, it's very, very, very rainfall driven which obviously in turn impacts on the prey base. So if they've had good rains, 
um, you know, you can have uh, you can have a litter in in January, February, and you could even have another litter again in October, November. Um, the other thing that would impact on that is if something happens to the litter, which is you know, it, it's nature. Um, it could happen. You could have a burrow collapse. You could have predation on these youngsters. A lot of things can happen to them. And then that female will actually come into heat again pretty soon after that, and have another litter. So absolutely, they can have more than one litter a year. So on small mammals like this, that's not uncommon. I used to have pet rats many years ago, and they're just absolutely the coolest things on the planet. And rats can have more than one litter a year. Yeah, I had rats as pets. Strike force, their closest relative are, are they are related to the mongooses, so they actually are a kind of mongoose. Um her pest today. And so any of the other mongoose species that you've been seeing on on wild earth, I think they had some banded mongoose the other day and a slender mongoose. At Swallow we got things like a yellow mongoose. Up in the mountains or the hills here we've got a one that's very, very infrequently seen called the Cape Grey mongoose. And um yeah, so any of the mongoose species, even the ones in India, you know, the the big water mongoose, we get them in Africa as well. Um, Mellers, Salu, there's, there's lots of mongoose species and they're all related to meerkats. I'm so chuffed that we saw these guys coming back. Eh? I'm going to amble, I'm just going to walk over and see what the puff had. If there's any, I don't, I don't think it would have moved now, but I'm just going to look out of interest. And um, so in the meantime, head over to Tristan. Well, we're at Bithelzook Dam now. It's fairly quiet. Sun has just gone, unfortunately. It was so nice because it was kind of a perfect spot just on the hippos itself. You can see it's on the bank now. So it has just, just, just unfortunately left the hippos. But they were like in this little spot of light. It was really, really pretty as they were sitting there and they were kind of spraying every now and then. And as we were sitting here, a little young bull elephant has snuck up behind us. Hello, boy. What's he doing behind us there? I wonder if he's the start of the herd or if he's just on his own. You can hear the ever-present little grebes calling as well. The nice thing about our Buffalo's Hook hippos, and I don't know if anyone's seen this hippo. I can't remember... Um, anyone talking about it, but there's a little baby hippo at Buffalzook now. Has there been a baby hippo at Buffalzook for long? Long decade? Do you know? But you can just see its little head there. So there's a, yeah, a little baby one. I mean, it's not... It's not a huge hippo, but it's certainly... I mean, not, not a tiny, tiny, tiny baby, but it's certainly a small one. Um, I don't remember seeing a small hippo in Buffalzook Dam which is really cool. It's nice to see that there's a little one here. Um, it's not as small as I think what David had this uh, this morning at Chitwa Dam, um, but it's still little, and it's quite funny to watch it. I think it's a bit deep where it's sitting now. So it climbs on its mother's back, and when mom moves, this poor little one has to move as well. You can see mom's nose kind of just went up and then down again. Um, so... <laughs> Look how cool that is. Are you just sitting on your mother's back, having the best time? Pretty. So nice just to sit here and listen to them breathing. I'll keep quiet for you guys to hear better. That's very rude elephant. I don't know if you guys picked that up, but our elephant just made a 
a little whipsy behind us and uh, blew off some steam, so to speak. <laughs> so I don't know if it came through, but yeah. Where was that uh, bit of gas pulled up behind you there? <laughs> so I believe you guys could hear something very gassy. Um, that is where it was coming from, is that uh, cheeky little boy that's chasing the starlings. Leave the starling alone. It's not doing anything to you. Young bull elephants, they're always so naughty. They end up chasing starlings and doing all kinds of other things. Poor birds. Gremlins General, you said you did notice. I uh, thought you might have. Um, <laughs> it wasn't exactly incognito, was it? Um, it was a, a serious amount of gas that was let off there. It's amazing how you're trying to have this quiet, peaceful moment at the dam, listening to the natural sounds, and typical young boy has to ruin it with, with you know, he's probably chuckling at this stage, um, having a good laugh at himself and his um, little faux pas that he's just had um, on camera. Always shy now and going to move away. <laughs> but there's definitely been a change in the last few days um, of uh, driving around, not from a point of view of temperature, but activity at waterholes has changed a lot. Starting to see more and more the big waterholes being used by elephant and um, buffalo and those kind of things. And the more I've been driving around in the course of the last kind of few days that I've been here, um, a lot of the smaller little pans or mud wallows have dried completely since I've been here. So when I first got here, there was a little bit of water in them and they're now all starting to dry up. And that's going to suck a lot of animals towards these bigger dams. And it's going to start becoming easier and easier to find congregations of animals. So sitting at a dam like this, you'll have elephant come in, you'll have buffalo, you'll have kudu, you'll water buck, whatever it may be. They'll start to kind of filter in and you'll get a lot more activity around the big water holes than what we have been having. Um, so it's going to be really important to utilize these um, going forward. Uh, I think these are going to be little hot spots, particularly Buffalo's Oak Dam. Hello, cute little face. That is very, very cute. Now, if you want to see what plays out at all of these water holes, we were discussing this this morning, but if you do want to see, um, it's going to require a little bit of support from all of you because we're going to need your support in order to continue through the winter months and into the summer where you'll get to see the seasons change and how these dams really kind of change and become into their own during late winter periods. And you just need to follow the support link below and you'll be able to get all the details for it. And like I said, it'll be most appreciated and really nice for you guys to see it. This You cannot believe what this can look like. Um, this particular area, let me see, I might, might just maybe have a photo. I haven't posted this one on my Instagram yet, but I will at some point. Um, let me see if I can find it for you guys quickly. Just have a nice look. Alex, if you can do a nice wide shot of Buffalzook Dam, because when I show you this, you guys will be probably fairly shocked at what it looked like in November of 2018. Okay, so that's what Buffalzook Dam looks like now. Now from this, it's not quite the same viewpoint, but if you had to turn the car around and face the opposite way, and then look down into the dam in, tw in November 2018, that's what this dam looked like. There's a leopard crossing the dam. It was just dry, cracked mud. So all of that water that you see behind us has filled up in the beginning of this year. Um, that's what it looks like when there's no water. It becomes this kind of cracked, dry, muddy area. That's for Sana. This was a very cool day that we had. He was hunting baby Egyptian geese across the cracked mud. It was pretty cool to watch. But that's what this eventually will end up looking like. It will change completely from water like this to a much smaller area. Although I don't think it will dry up like that photograph this year. And there's too much water and the temperatures are already plummeted too much to have huge amounts of evaporation that will pull that uh, water down to nothing. But it will drop a lot and it has dropped already uh, a long way. If you look on the bank where the hippos are, just above them, there's a, a water line that is on that bank. Um, and you'll see just where the water was during the, the kind of height of this dam and how much it's already dropped. I think it's one of our little grebes, past little baby. The two babies are making friends. <laughs> That's so cute. I love how these baby hippos sit on the back of their moms. Um, you see that it's literally balancing on top of its mother. 
cute man. A baby hippo is a cute thing. Little one, you're going to fall off if you're not careful. <laughs> That's uber cute. Shame, man. Frigates, I'm afraid it's not great what hippos do during the drought. They try and search for water and they will go as far and as wide as they can and unfortunately many of them do succumb to a drought. Um, it's something that is hard to watch. Um, if you're a person that likes nature and things, hippos that um, end up getting forced out of water holes like this have to go and try and find other places and eventually you actually start to see them just in underneath bushes and um, in little dry riverbeds trying to just seek shade more than actually being in water um, and trying to survive from there. It's, it's really very, very, very difficult for them and I always feel terrible for, for hippos during a drought period. Um, there was a number of hippos that dry, died during the last drought, the 2016-2017 drought. Um, and in fact, you know, Bifuzuk Dam had hippos prior to that and, and unfortunately they then disappeared from this area and where they ended up, if they survived, we don't really know. Um, it's an unfortunate thing that happens in the drought. The drought is a, a really, really, really hard thing to watch. Um, you know, to seeing animals going through a period of almost severe suffering in that they lose condition. Oh, more elephants are arriving. I was going to leave Bifuzuk Dam, but it might as well just sit here. There's just one thing after another. I heard some Franklin's alarm calling, so you never know. Maybe something else arrives here. Come on, Tandy, bring us your two cubs and come past here. Let's have that. Wouldn't that be nice? Tandy and the two cubs and then Tingana from the other side. A herd of elephants. Then we would be winning, I think. Oh, they're a tiny, tiny baby. Little elephant coming. You see it there, Alex? Mm -hmm. Let's see if it's going to come out. All right, well, it sounds like we're going to be losing the light at... So the elephants make their way. So all of them disappeared down those burrows, as you saw earlier. And what's interesting is we were chatting yesterday about, well, one of the viewers actually asked, are these burrows connected underground? And I answered, well, some of them are, some of them aren't. And we've actually seen that really, really nicely now, where the burrow on the far right that they went down in, they actually popped up where those, the ones that um, jandre has got in, in, in shot now, they popped out that burrow and the next one to the left. So there's at least three burrows in a row here that are connected underground. And um, I think the youngsters are somewhere down near the middle one but I have nothing to base that on just but just the fact that the the adult female came out that burrow after suckling and now she's standing right near that entrance but how beautiful is that backlighting as well but they are so sleepy and they've had a long day out just got so much personality I love the way sometimes their their teeth stick out from between their lips so my comms broke up there a little bit I was just saying I love the way their teeth stick out through their lips occasionally you can actually just see them between the top and the bottom lips protruding there a little bit very very cute eh? and again facing directly towards the sun to warm up before going to bed to tomorrow morning when we join them they'll be back facing east again for the sunrise 
But I know a couple of little meerkats are going to have a good night's rest tonight, so sure. They are so sleepy, these little ones. There's another one that's just come out on the far right over here. That's a little male, and he's going to do some bit of burrow maintenance there. Well, while these this little family is getting ready to go to bed, head over to Tristan and some elephants. Well, we do have some elephants. There's the tiniest little baby in here. It looks almost newborn. Um, it's very, very small. You can just see it underneath its mom's chin. It's quite wobbly still. Um, doesn't look very sure-footed at all. And you can see it's got a little bit nervous around the water. Don't fall backwards, little one, because you'll fall in the water. It still fits under its mother. I mean, maybe not as young as a newborn, maybe only two, three months old, I would say. But it's small, that's for sure. But look how cute that is. <laughs> that is very, very sweet. I'm hoping that it um, decides to come over the damn wall and then we should get a really, really nice view of them sort of coming over. But isn't that just sweet? See, it's trying to have a little drink. It's still at that stage where it's actually having to lift its head quite high to drink from its mother. So it's still very small. A sweet little thing. I didn't want to get any closer than what we are now. I felt like we were more than close enough. And you know, when they're little like this, they get a bit twitchy around water. And particularly when it's been as windy as it has, the moms can be a little bit funny. Um, they don't really like their little ones being around cars and things like that if it's been super windy. So can you hear her talking? You can hear lots of Ellie's around us. I heard some trumpeting just now. So I think there's quite a few more kind of coming but for the most part they are just enjoying having a small drink in that corner and then going back into the thickets to feed so I'm hoping that we're gonna see more of them come down just now but very 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 cool to have had a little baby like that see where the mother with the baby went. I think they're just behind the tree still. Because I'm hoping they come up on the dam wall, because if they come up on the dam wall, what I'm going to do, and you can hear a trumpet of another elephant, is I'm going to just drop onto the side of the dam wall, and we'll have them almost at eye level walking past, which will be very, very special. I've been wanting to have that with elephants, and I've never quite gotten it right at Bilfulsuk Dam. I've gotten it right with Hosanna um, twice here, and with an evoker male, not with, with Wild Earth, but on a, on a private trip. But um, I've always wanted Ellie's kind of walking along this damn wall towards me. And so maybe today we'll get it right. Oh, Ellie's are making lots of noise. Something's upsetting them. Okay, well, we're going to sit here. We're going to see if our little baby elephant comes up on the dam wall. In the meantime, though, let's send you back across to those meerkats. They haven't quite gone to bed just yet. this baby little hippo it's like baby overload cuteness it's got its mouth open and it was yawning at its mother almost play fighting oh no it's got the back down now let's just see if it does it again but it had its it was standing up and it has yawning at its mom and its mom was yawning back at it so it's like baby elephant or baby hippo i don't know which one to even watch at this stage um both of them are being equally cute unfortunately they're not coming up the damn wall they're walking away um I thought they might come this way, but they're not. 
can hear more of them coming. The trumpets are getting louder and louder. Right, so now it seems like the guys have sorted out their audio, so we're going to send you back across to them, and I'm going to go investigate why these Ellie's are trumpeting so much. These guys are so close to going to bed. These three little ones are dead tired. They made a very weak attempt at some play, but you see the one on the right. When he's not grooming, he sits up, and then he starts, like, falling over. This is the this is when they become really cute. You're going to see now. The little adult male, he's just gone down the burrow behind them. And every now and again you'll see dust kicking up. So he's just going to keep on maintaining those burrows, doing the homework or the housekeeping chores. I think mom's got her hands full with the little pups. And they'll normally be down the burrow before the sun is actually set. You know, it's a it's related to temperature gradient. So even though the sun may be up, your ambient temperature could be dropping quite quickly. In which case they'll go underground. Joy, these pups that have been born now. Um, it seems that uh, from our meerkat habituators when they located the group um, that they were probably born three days ago, four days ago. So these ones definitely haven't been above ground. And then these three um, miscreants that are sitting above ground here, um, they would have been born near the end of last year. Probably, yeah, probably November last year. October beginning of October last year so these new new pups are and I think well they're going to come out in about three weeks time and that's why it's going to be so exciting keeping track of this particular group that um, we can actually see and we can be here when those little pups come out for the first time because they then 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 you're going to see a new level of cuteness Shame that Idea meerkat, it, it's called a meerkat colony or meerkat um, family. Um, a troop of meerkats is is also correct. Of course, you get all these other um, collective nouns for animals, like a journey of giraffe and a dazzle of zebra, you know, those kind of things. But it's, you know, from a scientific perspective, that's not correct. You know, you, you'll you'll talk about a a herd of zebra or herd of giraffe um, but collective nouns always kind of grab our imagination because they're really descriptive and fun and it's always cool ways of using words you know, terminology like that but this is a meerkat family a meerkat troop is correct colony Yeah, Londeka says a mob. A mob is a very, very good term for these meerkats. Because when you see them actually, that would be a nice collective noun for them. Because when you see them actually going for a predator, <clears throat> doesn't matter what it is, whether it's a snake or a, uh, another group of meerkats, for instance, yes, and then they just pack together and they mob and they mob and they mob and they mob. So that's not bad. The little one at the back is doing his yoga. See his feet in the air. He's having a good groom. <clears throat> so like like any any animal that that maintenance of the coat is important. You know, that constant grooming. Any kind of parasites. Um make, making sure the 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 hair is in good condition for thermoregulation, camouflage, very, very important to Andrew and I, we're just going to sit here and wait for these guys to go to bed. Um, so while we're doing that, head over to David. 
in the low felt and see what they got on that side. Managed to find some zebra. One of my favorite animals to look at out here. Their striking pattern. It's no wonder they're called the dazzle of zebra. They are dazzling. You may have heard the old story about how the zebras got their stripes, but it's always worth telling again. According to the Bushmen, way back when, when the world was created, the zebra were completely white and very, very proud of them. Them white coats. And Mr. Baboon was a bit ugly and a bit jealous. So what he did is he invited the zebra over to his campfire and Zebra said sure he'll come enjoy the warmth of the campfire with the baboon but what he didn't know is the baboon was a, a trickster and he put some rocks around the campfire hidden in the grass and the beautiful white zebra came walking up to the campfire all proud Give you an anticipation of the end of the story while we reposition so we can get another look. And this beautiful white zebra stallion, so proud of his snow white skin and coat, walked up to this campfire. And right when he got to the edge of the campfire, he tripped over the hidden rocks and fell into the fire burned black stripes all over his body. He was no longer snow white. And the baboon laughed and laughed and laughed. And that is how zebras came to have black stripes. Although, I don't know, I think a completely white zebra would look a bit funny. I think the baboons helped them. Ready Ruby, you've asked why do you never see a thin zebra? And it's an interesting observation on your part. They always seem to be a bit fat, even in the middle of our worst droughts when there's no grass to be eaten. Zebras always seem fat. And it has puzzled people for many years. And the reason for that is that zebra are hindgut fermentators, fermentators, meaning they bulk grazers that require a digestive system that is constantly digesting and fermenting grass and that fermentation process gives off a lot of gas so they're very bloated that's why you often hear the zebra giving a little bit of a fart when they run similar to horses actually but those stomachs are always bloated even in the middle of winter when their general grass diet is depleted. With most animals, when they are under-conditioned or very hungry, 
they get skinny, it's noticeable. With zebra, their stomachs stay bloated because they still have to have that huge gas build up for their digestive system. And the only real way to tell that a zebra is losing condition is you actually see their mane. You can see that one has a beautiful mane, it's standing up straight. That mane actually starts to fall to the side because the fat in their neck area along their spine that holds up that mane actually depletes and that hair starts to kind of flop down. That's a very good indicator that a zebra has lost condition. A very good observation there, Ruby. That's the reason that they always seem to be so fat. Striped horse, you've asked a question. Or is FC just pulling my leg? That is just classic. I often call them pajama donkeys. Some people call them disco donkeys, but striped horse is most certainly another name for them. So, what a coincidence. You've asked, what is a zebra's top speed? I'm not actually 100% sure on the top speed, if I had to guess it'd probably be in the region of about 60 kilometers an hour but I'll have to look that one up for you they are quick when they gallop FC's giving me feedback. Google says 64 kilometers an hour, so my estimation of 60 k's an hour is pretty good. Around that. Just a little bit faster than a lion can run. So if a lion was to catch a striped horse, I mean a zebra, sorry, not you, then have to have the element of surprise, it would have to be able to pounce on it and grab it before it could actually get up to its speed and run. And even then, it would have to be quite careful because zebra can deliver very powerful kicks similar to a horse. And if they catch a lion in the jaw, it will be very detrimental for the lion. So they can be very feisty. Stallions that fight often injure each other quite badly when they kick and bite. Well, lovely to spend some time with the zebra. It sounds like Ngala has got some action. Let's go see what's happening. is a pretty loose term to use for these but um but yeah they are starting to get a little bit more active and they're starting to move around a little bit more there's more grooming a few individuals have gone up to go and groom each other there's a few that have gone to go to the loo see the beautiful night nice sky behind us deep purple color. Miss Lioness has been looking at the opposite bank for the last while and we haven't quite seen what she's looking at but she seemed pretty focused. For now she is starting to lose attention I think. She's not really focusing too much on what was happening on the opposite bank. Basically, the, the only 
lions that have really started to, to show a bit of activity are the three females that we can see around here. The, the cubs up there have really just been moving around each other and keeping each other nice and warm. So there's a, a lion triangle. So I think it will just stand up and then it will try and reposition again. What we're waiting for is just that one lion that was calling in the distance to call. And then hopefully all of them will just start. It will be quite an incredible sound. I've, I've had male lions calling around my vehicle before. I've had one or two females calling. I've had a male and a female. But I've never had a male lion with four females calling. And I think that's exactly what was happening this morning. And that's why I'm pretty desperate for at least some of them to call. So there's another very, very good sign, and that line is now going to the loo. Our wind is pretty good, so luckily we're not going to be smelling too much of what's going on there, but uh, I don't think it's, a, it, it's too bad. Uh, it's just a wee. It's going to come to this older lioness for a bit of attention. No, it's not. And that's the young male there. He's had his head up every now and again. And I think he's just making sure that the pride isn't moving away without him. And so he picks up his head, he sees that they're sleeping, and then he just basically puts his head back down again. But as soon as, as they show a little bit more movement, he'll start following them. Now, Jant is asking how far a male lion's roar can be heard. And it depends on the conditions, I guess. Uh, on a night like tonight, the wind has started to settle down and it's starting to become very cold. And sound will travel much further in cold conditions. So, I mean, humans have been said to hear lions calling from at least eight kilometers away. That's roughly four and a half, five miles. But I'm sure lions would probably be able to hear other lions at least... Oh, double that distance, so 16 kilometers, maybe even closer to 18 kilometers, if the weather's good. And that call is just, I mean, it's to mark their territory, but it's also to find one another. And so within this pride over here, there's two dominant males. So this male could eventually call out for his brother, and then the rest of the pride might join in. I think the only one that wouldn't join in would be that young male. He wouldn't want two big <laughs> dominant males potentially coming into the same area at the same time. I've, I've done my very best to scan with my binoculars on the opposite bank, look for any sign of movement, and I haven't seen anything that this lioness is so focused on you know, she look how wide her eyes are see and this time it's not only her the rest of the pride has reacted there must have been a noise that she heard we're just going to quickly switch over to infrared so you'll see a slight different color change just look at those people those eyes are wide the pupils are still very narrow I wonder what it might be. I mean, uh, I can see an impala finally at the very, very top of the bank. Yeah, so I think it might just be an impala that that spurred their attention. It is a, a male, and so, I mean, maybe they were even hearing it way before we did. But it's right at the top of the bank on the opposite side, probably about 100 meters away. So, I mean, this lioness that we were watching a bit earlier is the experienced one. She'll know that it's not really not really too worried about going after it. And those ones standing or facing away from us are the two white ones. They've been cuddling up to each other the whole day. of a sneeze and just look at how, how clean they are I mean 
they're so much cleaner than they were this morning, and so they must have done a lot of grooming. Big yawn. The interesting thing is that they're facing straight in the direction of the way that lioness has got her den site. So I've just got these visions of you tomorrow morning watching the whole pride meeting the cubs for the very first time. That would be an incredible sighting. curiosity of youth that just walked over to a rock and padded it to see what it was. No. <laughs> I'll lend it. it is very precious. Especially when they, they're behaving so nicely like this. I'm just going to back up a bit. There might be a bit more interaction with these How's that, eh? This is fine. So when? So this is, these are the few ones that have come down from the sandbank and are, are practically lying in the river. And so we've got the, the middle-aged lioness is the one on the right-hand side with three cubs and then one of the, the older, more experienced lionesses on the far left. So the, the first one on the left-hand side, the one that's just yawning. This one has got its paw just draped over the bank. There we go. She's up. Another big yawn. Luke, you're wondering if there's going to be a lion hunt? And I think so. I mean, the way that that one lioness was so intently staring at that impala, she was definitely weighing up her options, thinking about, you know, if, if it could be a good opportunity for her to try and hunt. And she obviously worked out that it wasn't, but that doesn't mean the hunt is over for the night. It's literally just beginning. And so all of these lionesses are noses up, they're smelling, they're hearing, they're just trying to take in as much information as possible. See, so this is the, the old experienced lioness. Doesn't look like she's wanting to move too far, but she is moving a bit further than, than she has the whole day. <laughs> yeah, Owen's just commenting that we are now in the perfect position to be hit by the smell of what these lions have left behind, and it's hitting us quite strongly. Okay, so now we have two lionesses on the move, with the big male looking, and one of the older, I mean, the, the, yeah, the older lioness still looking. And now they've just sat down, so we are completely surrounded by lions. Got lions all over us. See this one here? This one's just walked past our vehicle and laying down. <laughs> Looking in the direction of that impala still. And then there's one directly behind us. lionesses that have gotten up and moved are probably just putting her, their feelers out. I suppose, I mean, around the pride there's lots of smells and, and noises that the pride is moving as they're yawning and rolling around. And so just separating themselves just gives them that opportunity to be able to just take in some smells that aren't lions. Alamo, you saying that they... Alma, Al the more you're saying that this is awesome, it really is. I mean, especially because we've taken the time and we've sat here for two hours or so waiting for this exact moment for them to be up and moving around. And it's a slow process. I mean, it's, they, they like to hit the snooze button a lot, I guess. They don't get out and, and spring straight out of bed. It takes them a while, you know. They get up, they start cleaning in themselves, they might move. Then they rest again, then they get up until eventually they, once everyone is on the same page, they might decide to, to stick to a direction. See, so, <laughs> there's 
these two little cubs are just taking in our vehicle and just watching us every single time we take a quick little shift when we move in our seats they just focus in on us at this distance it's perfectly fine but if they come a lot closer then we'll just maybe start the engine or just try and tap the vehicle to deter them from coming close at this age it's all cute and well when they come and, and start touching our vehicle but when they 200 kilograms two years down the line and they've gotten into the habit of coming up towards a vehicle it's when it can be a little bit dangerous so if they do decide to come and investigate us a bit more but usually just a start of the vehicle or a tap on the bonnet or something like that will deter them and then they realize that you know, we're here but they can't come and touch us Someone's falling asleep again. Just love how subtly those ears move. If you just watch how they slowly start twisting. You know, Catherine, it is a very sweet face. I was just mentioning now that we're so close up, you get to see those little subtleties, the slight movement of the ear, you know, closing of the eyes, and those small little signs will probably be quite a, a, a clear communication between the rest of the pride. And behind the ears, I'm sure you all know that they've got black. Do you want me to get out the shot here? <laughs> um, they've got black behind the ears just like this one we can see I think I'm almost touching the, the black ears there and so that just helps them see a lot better and so a flick of the ear here and there might mean different things different signals to the rest of the pride so they can communicate with one another without having to vocalize as soon as they start calling to one another that gives away their position and then the hunt is effectively over so this one's up I'm sure it will walk straight past us if it does come any closer, see, now watch, I'll just start the vehicle. Okay. <laughs> so there we go, it's, it's just taken, it, it's got the signal from us that it can't come any closer and I might have to do it again. Um, but whilst we're trying to deter this lion from taking a bite out of my my chunky thighs, we'll send you across to David and see what he's doing. Welcome back. We've just quickly popped across to some Bambili to see if we can see anything or find anything. So far, just a zebra. It's been a lovely sunset. A lovely view of the mountains. Watch the setting sun. And now it's time for nocturnal life to come out. Too far from where we last saw trucks for Hukumuri, so maybe if we get lucky and see him on the road or on a termite mound. That's kind of what I'm hoping for. Sounds like Tristan managed to catch up with those buffalo from this morning that we were looking for. So let's send you over to him and see what they're up to. We have indeed, David. I, I don't know if David had them or was looking for them. Um, we've with a big bull elephant and a herd of buffalo that are slowly making their way to the 
uh, Gari Dam in front of the camp. So those of you that watch on the dam cam, you're about to be inundated with subjects to look at. So we've got a hippo, we've got buffalo, and we've got an elephant. And hopefully Tingana is going to make an appearance as a last-minute leopard in amongst all of this. Wouldn't that be nice if he just pops up onto the dam wall here because of this elephant and buffalo movement? I would so love that. His truck went right where I'm parked right now is where he kind of went. He just went over the back behind me. Um, he's, I've had him there quite a few times lying in that area. Just kind of pops down into the da behind the damn wall here and kind of does his thing. So I wonder if he's not still just lying somewhere here. There's definitely no tracks to indicate that he's uh, left, but it's not to say he hasn't. Hello, Dewey. Good evening to you too. I think I might have interrupted Dewey coming out for the evening by coming over the dam wall. He was right up against the dam wall, which is not ideal, but he'll find another spot. There's at least lots of places for him to exit. Um, maybe he was just interested in hearing the buffalo and the elephant, and that's why he'd come close to the dam wall. But yeah, you can see the buffalo just coming across the dam wall now in front of us. They're going to go down and have a little bit of a drink and um, head to the corner of the water. Go a little bit closer for you, Alex, because it's going to be difficult with the infrared for you to see. So we're going to just try and get to a point where we can actually see them a little bit, because it is quite dark now. I've obviously got my lights off. What is that? I see an eye in the distance, just one. I want to just use my binoculars to see what it is. Imagine if it's Tingana, but it doesn't look like it because it's not binocular vision, so it wouldn't be what... Can you, can you see anything there? Maybe a scrub here. It's moved off. I don't know what it was. Ah, uh, it's a night jar flying, that's what it is. Sorry, Alex. Just saw his eyes, but it's quite cool with the buffalo. They're actually lining up in front of the, the light that kind of works for the infrared, um, for the dam cam. So that's that light there, but it's quite kind of ghostly to see these shapes moving in front of the light. Uh, it's not something you'd normally see when it comes to, to buffalo at this time of the day. Um, but that's how we're able to actually pick up a lot of the things that walk around here and the dam cam, particularly the dam wall just highlights things. Dewey's not impressed by the, <laughs> by the buffalo arriving at his water hole. He's thrashing about. Dewey, your peaceful evening just got ruined. You've got an elephant, you've got us, you've got buffalo. Not pleasant for poor old Dewey. He's going, I wonder if he's going to chase these buffalo. Let's have a look what happens here. I know he's done it before. Look, he's just kind of motoring straight at them. Look, look, look. Are you going to chase them away? Exactly, there's a stare down of night taking place at the moment. How crazy is this? We've got three of Africa's biggest herbivores in the exact same spot. As what I was alluding to earlier is that these... Look, look, look. So that's all a display to try and intimidate these buffalo, to say to them, I'm not happy with you guys here. Um, don't want you at my water hole. Stay away. Um, but obviously you can see the buffalo are in no way perturbed by his nonsense and are just carrying on with their day. And there's still a lot of buffalo to come. Um, this is a very, very small fraction of what's on its way. I can see they're still coming up from Twin Dams Road. Um, so we're gonna get quite a lot more arriving as we sit here. What I wanna do, Alex, I'm gonna just go forward a little bit just to get this light out of the frame because it's gonna mess with Alex's shot quite heavy. So I just wanna go forward a little, little, little bit. I obviously don't want to spook the buffalo too much because they might panic and run. But if we can just get to a point where we don't have that light in the frame all the time, it'll really help. As 
So Chris, you're saying Dewey is saying the dam is not big enough to accommodate all of us, um, all the 50 of us. Um, yes, not happy. <laughs> this is what it looks like when a hippo has a temper tantrum about sharing. He uh, clearly had, didn't share much as a child and uh, is having a little frothy about the fact that he has to share his water hole now. It's been so nice just him on his own that he's now getting a little upset by this fact. Um, <laughs> and so he's having a little meltdown. Dewey, play nice with your new friends. Don't get upset with them. They're not doing anything to you. And get used to it, because there's going to be a lot more of them coming every day as it gets drier. Look at him, he's getting closer again. Isn't the sound just incredible? So I educated our directors this afternoon about a song that's called Hit Me With Your Rhythm Stick, um, neither, which, neither of which had uh, any idea even existed. Um, and so they're commenting that I should um, teach the buffalo about Hit Me With Your Rhythm Stick and Dewey as well. Um, they thought that I was playing the fool when they told them about that song, but I most definitely wasn't. <laughs> it is legitimately a song and it always reminds me of a friend of mine that I had at school he used to always quote it I don't know why um, but he did it's quite cool with the sort of side light on them just make and then the glow of the infrared from our side of their eyes it makes them look quite creepy um, with this sort of little bit of illuminated face and glowing eyes uh, <laughs> makes a for an interesting, almost like a horror movie in some ways. Well, what's also interesting is how we keep having buffalo at Juma, except when the Inkumas are here. Inkumas are here, no buffalo. Inkumas are gone, buffalo everywhere. It's a weird dynamic at the moment. And the Inkumas are well and truly gone at the moment. I got an update about them today. They are miles away. They were seen by the Singita guys. Um, Apparently, they're all the way um, close to the Nyati ottawa break, um, which is the opposite end of Ottawa, so the far western side of Ottawa, um, which is a long, 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 long way from where we are. So I don't think we'll expect the Inkuhumas anytime soon. Um, I reckon it's going to be a good couple of days before they arrive back this side. All right, well, I'm going to sit here and just enjoy I mean, uh, like I say, we've got elephant, we've got buffalo, we've got a hippo. There's a potential for a leopard in this area. So while we enjoy this and just take in the sights and sounds that send you across to Swalu Kalahari, I would imagine their sun is starting to set. Um, and I wonder what Dylan's up to now. So we just ambling along here. There was a report a couple of minutes ago of cheetah in this area and so we're just going to amble along here see if we get any any visual it'll be a bit of luck um, the light is dropping very very rapidly now and the other thing here this is slap bang in the core territory of the Makala meerkat group so you're driving off-road you've obviously got to be very very careful about that as well um, so we're just going to go slowly along here and hopefully we'll be lucky. The sun is now set, so we're losing light now as well. But old Eagle Eye Yandra is on the back here. Won't miss a cheetah.
Shudulusan, I have seen king cheetah, but not on Swalu. Um, I've seen them actually in that Ngala and Juma area before. Very, very rare sightings and beautiful animals. And interestingly, to the best of my knowledge, they've actually never been recorded um, north of the Zambezi River, King Cheetah. Um, so that's, that's quite interesting in terms of genetics. Someone asked me yes. Someone asked me yesterday in terms of the the what were the population of leopard and cheetah numbers left in the world. So cheetah, the population standing on an estimated between six and seven thousand. Leopard numbers are actually globally currently very poorly known, but there are more of them than cheetah. Um, the, the challenge is you got nine different subspecies, recognised subspecies of leopard. And um, of those, a number are critically endangered, very, very small populations of them. Um, so, yeah, I wouldn't say either species is doing particularly well. Um, but anyway, our light is dropping, so we're going to focus on either trying to find tracks or getting a glimpse of these cheetah off to the left here. Um, so head back to David um, with the leopard sighting. And our gut feel paid off. None other than Hukumuri walking in front of us. Busy marking his, his territory. He just gave a territorial call a few moments ago. Hopefully we get to hear it again. Super, super happy that we managed to find him. The last couple of days since he left his kill, I saw his tracks in different places. And then this evening we thought we'd give it one last try in that region, and it has paid off. Start up and go. Gizmo, you say this is so cool. It is epic, eh? So, so cool to see him again. Remember last time we saw him, he was eating that young impala. Now he's busy doing his territorial rounds. I'm just going to make a call on the radio. Give me one sec. I've got Dukumuri on Vuatele Access heading east. Give him some light there so you can see a bit better. We do. Let me see if we can get ahead of him here in the bush. Have a look at him from the front. Michelle, you say that walk, only the hook. I agree. Got a very unique walk. That ragged face of his, worn by many epic battles. How many cubs has he sired? How many fights has he been in? fights with other leopards to keep his territory perhaps expand 
How many animals has he caught? How many injuries has he sustained in the hunt? This boy's got a few stories to tell. Dave, come in, Dave. Okay. Get ahead of him again. Yeah, boy, I'm uh, sticking with him. I'm the only vehicle here. You're welcome to make your way. Still on word to access, not far from Triple M, heading east. I'm hoping he gives us a little territorial call in the next couple of minutes. Let me put the lights back on, otherwise I can't see the road, even though we've got infrared. Rather not drive without my lights. Get ahead of him here again. I do know Darby absolutely loves this leopard and it's just reminded me that they are doing an Instagram live after this afternoon sunrise safari so please join Lauren and Darby as they talk about Ethiopia and wolves. That will be at Wild Earth Official. Well, this is super cool. We're definitely going to stick with him for a few minutes longer. I want to see if he gives us another territorial call Well, this has been an absolutely epic sunset safari and I would end it no other way than following the hook down the road. It's been a lovely spending time with all of you. Wherever you are in the world, we wish you a lovely day further. Until then, cheers. I thought 